Hello everyone and welcome to Ausgem Thailand's Business Connections Community, an online program where we provide you updates of the Australian Thai business community. I'm your host Brendan Cunningham, the Executive Director of Ausgem. Coming up today, we welcome the CEO of the Thailand Business Unit at Macro and he provides us with an update on the impact of COVID-19 on the Thai retail sector. We venture north to meet friends of Thai daughters in Chiang Rai. And in our connection section, we look at golf as a way of getting us back together networking. Stay with us. Welcome back. In our business section today, we look at how COVID-19 has impacted the retail sector in Thailand. And we welcome Ricardo Barreto, CEO of Thailand Business Unit for Macro. Ricardo, how are you? Great, thank you. Thank you very much, Brandon, for the invitation. Oh, pleasure, it's good to see you again. <laughs> thank you. So Ricardo, let's start with a big picture look, a snapshot of how the retail sector has been impacted by COVID-19. Was there an increase or decline in business at certain stages? Look, in general, retail showed a quite good resilience. Of course, uh, there are several different kind of stores, there are several kind of retailers, and not all of them behaved in the same, certain, the same way. But in general, we all had a he huge health crisis because we all had stores and we needed to make sure that everybody in our stores were safe. And of course, we saw accelerations of trends. We saw huge speed on changes of customer behaviors and also e-commerce. And we saw a lot of changes also on what the people were buying. Uh, you can, we cannot forget that we were having more than 30 million tourists in Thailand mm -hmm. and these people didn't come this yeah. year. And retail today is mostly pushed by the internal consumption. And of course, that makes changes. And you saw changes on the mix of products that we are buying. For example, we don't sell so many international assortments, for example, as we were selling in the past. But we also see people more focused on health because now people are more and more worried about covirus and everybody knows the impact and all the importance to be healthy. You saw also that people are now working from home and cooking more from home then looking more for ingredients, looking more for fruits and vegetables, for example. But also, there is less money in the market. It's very clear, and people are looking for more value for money. That is very clear. People are more careful in what they are buying. And another trend, a very interesting trend that we saw, it, is that people are also buying more locally. Mm. Local shops gain an importance that they will probably, in a certain way, I would say losing but they came very, very strong on during these pandemics, right. which is a very, very interesting because the other trend is also the online part, right. which clearly accelerated very, very, very fast. Would, would that, so the, the local buying, I guess that would relate to people not wanting to travel as far. Usually people would travel to a, a macro to have a big shop, but they might have just been buying uh, as close as they could get to the, the local side. Yeah, what we saw is people got a little bit more scared mm -hmm. or people so got stuck at home, if you can say that. And they were just, they didn't want to travel, they don't want to use public transports. Then yes. the tendency would go that they would go for their local shops. Mm. Uh, it was an interesting point you made about uh, having 30 million new arrivals come every year with tourism, business travel, etc. 2019, we were expecting 40 million people to come. <laughs> yes. Uh, so that's a huge impact. Uh, so hopefully it comes back, but what are your thoughts on the forecast for the rest of 2021 and beyond? In normal situations, and normally this is a very, very important period for us in retail, at least for us at Macro, because it's the period that we prepare our business plans for next year, also our forecast for the end of the year. And by rule, in a normal situation, I would tell you in a quite precise way how we would finish the year and probably the next six months of the year. 
at this moment, it's very hard to predict. Mm. Uh, we are depending on a lot of factors. Clearly, the biggest far factor is Covarus. Depends very much how it is going to evolve. Is the country going to open up or not? Are they going to have any kind of other resurgence in other countries? Mm. If we see an opening of the country, and I still feel that that will be the case, and I still am quite positive for 2022. I hope I'm right. <laughs> <laughs> we all hope you're right. Uh, what about the overall way you do business? Uh, how has that been impacted? It changed. It changed, it changed in the stores and it changed in the head office. Mm -hmm. uh, I would say in the conversation, if you would have a conversation with a lot of people in retail two or three years ago, and you would say, how about your team working in a flexible way, working from home? Everybody would say, impossible. Mm -hmm. In retail, that is not possible. And we saw that it's possible, that suddenly we moved everybody working from home. Mm -hmm. And retail is very relation. Mm -hmm. And it's you, uh, uh, the life of someone in the head office, especially on the procurement teams, you are back to back meetings with suppliers, with your teams and so on. And all of this disappeared. Now, important part right in the beginning was making sure that people were feeling well, mm -hmm. because a lot of people were still very scared but also making sure that the people kept focused on day-to-day -day activities. That was the first challenge. I think today the biggest challenge will be how to bring back the people to yes. back from home to the head office. But of course also we had another topic which is on the operations on the stores. Mm -hmm. Because clearly the stores are the ones who are more in contact with people. Right. And we work substantially first of all to make sure that the people were safe. Mm -hmm. Our customers, our suppliers, and our people. Uh, but you also saw an acceleration of e-commerce. Yes. You saw also an acceleration of e-payments. Mm -hmm. And especially on e-commerce, it obliged us to adapt. Because we passed suddenly from a day that, for example, we would have 10 orders on one store and suddenly in the next day we pass to have 100, 200 orders. Wow. And that obliged clearly a readjustment of the operations. A readjustment how we were structuring the teams, readjustment how we were structuring the people who were pick doing the pickings in the stores, the transportations, to deal with this huge amount of uh, volumes that appeared. And I think we all passed the same on the retail. Right. And it was a clear way, adapt. Adapt very fast, the things are changing very fast and you needed to find solutions on the next day. We were able to adapt the operations and to create new spaces for operational part in less than two weeks. Repositioning our space that we had in our stores, relook the traffic and the flows, and we were able to do that in a very, very speedy way. Right. It's, in, it's interesting. Uh, so a lot, a lot of product was going out, home delivery. I, I'm sure you saw a, a huge change in that. Um, I have an interesting question. I know while it never occurred, at certain times during the pandemic, uh, there, was, uh, there were some empty shelves I in different shops along the way. And there were certainly some concerns over long-term product shortages. Uh, what's your take on that? First of all, I can assure you all, don't panic. Mm. There is no need for that. But to explain you a little bit more, I mean, we passed here two critical moments during this crisis. The first one was around March, April last year, mm -hmm. when we had this panic buying. Every buy came to the stores. We had huge queues. The sales spiked. And we needed to make sure that we replenished very, very fast the stores. Unfortunately, we were prepared. We bought extra stock, we had extra people, and we passed it in a quite smooth way. The second situation that we all in retail, food retail, passed was around two months ago when, when they had the peak of infection. And we all have been some way, somehow impacted on the supply chain. The retailers, the supply chain, or the, the logistics centers, and also the suppliers. Mm -hmm. The good part of all of this is that we all learned and we all worked very fast, very, very, very well together. And we were able to communicate, keep it, the communication very close and very speedy and to solve all the problems that were coming. 
-hmm. But there were tough si decisions that we had to take because yeah. there were moments that we didn't have enough capacity or the supply didn't have enough capacity. And we need to make, you had to make choices. Right. And the choices were make sure that the fundamentals are there. Right. Probably you could not find your mustard, that special brand that you <laughs> wanted, but I'm sure that you could find all the essentials. And that was a very short period yeah. because we were all uh, very able to adapt. And I have to say that the, all the teams, our, our teams work very, very hard. But also I have to thanks also to our business partners and mm -hmm. our suppliers that they work very closely together, always helping us to solve problems. And it was really, really when I saw a really huge collaboration between both parts. Mm -hmm. And seeing that working together always produces, because in the end, we were all trying to avoid that any, the people would panic, that anybody would think there is not enough product, mm -hmm. because it's not the reality. There was enough product. It was just the way to make it arriving to the stores. And I think we all made it a very successful way. Mm -hmm. Today, I have to say, nobody has to worry about it. I think no. we will learn a lot with it, and we are all very prepared if any time in the future another situation would come. And yes, I can certainly confirm that uh, we certainly, my household, never went without any product, essential products um, over the past 18 months. Um, let's finish up with an update on macro. Uh, what's it been like for the past 18 months for your team? You mentioned there's a lot of work from home. Uh, can you provide a further update? It was, it was times of adaptation, clearly. Uh, hard work and uh, being, I'm very grateful for the team that we have. They've been doing a fantastic job, working very hard to make sure that the business goes as smoothly as possible. In topics like we talked before, having products in our stores, but also in safety. Uh, we've been working very, very hard to make sure that everybody is safe. And everybody, as I said before, is our people, but also our customers and also our suppliers. It, that was our main priority, and it will continue because we are not still in. But clearly, we're also looking at the market, looking that there are still a lot of opportunities there. We also know that we hope very soon this crisis will start to go up. And, and we work especially with small suppliers and small SMEs and small customers, and we want to support them and continue to support them in the near future especially when the business will start to pick up, they will need some support and we want to be there. But there's also clearly a trend on digital, mm -hmm. not only the, the online business, but also all what is related with back office. And we are investing and putting a lot of investment on that and be ready for what will be the next normal. When we want that also, we need to invest on people because retail is a business people. Yes. And it's extremely important that we continue to support our teams, develop our teams, and prepare them what is in the future. And but also, our stores also mm -hmm. will be always be a very important part of our business. And we want to continue to work in order to improve or improve our customer experience, that our customers feel good and happy and satisfied when they go and shop in our stores. But also, we are working also, of course, on sustainability. Uh, we want to continue to support the SMEs. It's very, very important that. It's also very important that we keep our business ethics and we are really strengthening on that, but also respecting the environment and making sure that we are a good citizen. Excellent. And if I could just go back on to the subject of people, you mentioned the importance of people. I believe you have a, a message for not only macro, but all of the frontline retail people who, who have worked hard through this pandemic? Yeah, I would say that the people that we are in the stores, the cashiers, the people who are serving you every day or replenish the stores, they are the real heroes on retail. They were the ones who kept the business going, even when a lot of us were working in a more safe environment from home, they were coming every day, making sure that nothing was missing in our stores that when we would go, we would shop, shop our foods, our fruits and vegetables, and in the most safest possible way. I think we have to thank them for their hardship. They still are because this still didn't go, but I think they are the real heroes of retail. 
I, I agree. Uh, knowing that there's always been someone there if we need to buy anything, I, I think they've really put themselves out there uh, and I certainly appreciate it as well. Okay. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. Well, Ricardo, thanks for coming in. It's good to see you again. Thank you. Thank yeah. you, Ron, for the invitation once more. It was a pleasure. Pleasure. Thank and uh, we'll look forward to catching up with you again soon. Thank you. Thank you. Great. That's Ricardo Barato, CEO of Thailand Business Unit at Macro. Coming up next, our connection section. Stay with us. Welcome back. In our connection section today, we meet Chris Watson, Chief Commercial Officer at Golf Asian, and we pose the question, will golf lead us back into the event and networking space? Chris, how are you? Very good, Brandon, how are you? Good very to be Very well. Um, Chris, let's start with some very big news on your side. Uh, what's new with Thailand's number one golf management company? Well, firstly, Brandon, it's great to be here with you today. Um, yeah, some big news. Uh, obviously, it's been a difficult time for everybody over the last 18 months with COVID-19. But, you know, in times like this, opportunities do present themselves. And we've managed to uh, merge with the uh, biggest tour operator in Asia, Golf Asian, uh, with myself taking up the new position of uh, CCO, Chief Commercial Officer of Golf Asian. So very, very exciting, exciting times and gives us not only the footprint we already had in the domestic market, but now we have a giant footprint of Gulf Asia and all over the world and Asia especially. Excellent. So it sounds like there are some big things ahead, which is great. You're in Phuket at the moment, and I believe that you're very busy. Uh, can you tell us what you've been doing since the sandbox opened? Yes, I made the decision to relocate down here uh, at the beginning of July um, because I hadn't been vaccinated, so I had to make it to Phuket before the doors shut. Uh, and it, we've, it's been it's been great for the family and also for the for the business. Um, luckily for me, my my wife can work remotely, uh, and for myself, it meant that I can be on the front line with all the sandbox customers. We've had weekly roll ups with them. We've had a few groups coming in, and it's really really helped us uh, be really the only inbound operator who's who's getting golfing customers in, into Phuket right now. I, I do know a lot of our members, uh, like yourself, they made the move down to Phuket when the sandbox opened. And, and quite fortunately, I think for you and for them, uh, a lot of them are golfers as well. So uh, while I haven't been able to join you, I believe there's been a strong Ozcham community playing golf down in Phuket, which does make me happy. Yeah, we've also had quite a lot of Ozcham, uh, Ozcham members play in, in the events as well. So it's been uh, great to catch up with those guys. It's really been a, a mix of expats returning uh, and also people from all over the world from the green countries who want to want to have the chance to have a holiday which people haven't been able to do for a long time. Excellent so our other members all over the country uh, and indeed out, outside Thailand have been asking about our events in general quite a lot when is sundown is coming back when are we going to be able to meet again to network again Ozcham is a very social networking type community um, can you ask us, uh, can you tell us, sorry, how you've adapted your events for COVID-19 so we can use as a guide for when we bring events back? Yeah, I, I think obviously the restrictions in place now, the restrictions change quite a lot as well. So it's very important that you can adapt what you're doing. Um, with regards to events, so right now no gatherings. So we're cutting the prize givings from events. Uh, we're also cutting shotguns. We're doing 1T starts. Uh, the, the safety is the priority for the for the customers, but obviously we want to give them the opportunity to be able to play golf and to be able to play in competitions. And with the Golf Genius app that we have, we can do the touchless scoring where only one person needs to be involved in the scoring. Um, there's no scorecards needed. Um, so really it's waiting to see the changes that the government put in place and uh, adapting the events to that and trying to carry on as as normal life as possible as, as we can with, a, with the golf events, including obviously being, being aware of those restrictions and the safety of all the players. <laughs> Excellent. I, I can assure you I would still be able to miss out with the improvement in numbers, but I'm sure I would have had a good day. <laughs> Great. So continuing on the topic of restrictions, um, we, 
it appears things are getting better countrywide, just from a pure golf management organisation of events point of view. How do you see the next few months progressing? Oh, I mean, it's difficult to say. Um, I mean, definitely they're making steps in the right direction. Uh, unfortunately, lockdown was probably what, what was needed. But now, obviously, in Bangkok, restaurants are opening up. Golf courses are open again with limited gathering. Um, in Phuket, there's still an alcohol ban in place, but there's still plenty plenty of people coming into the into the country. The, the restrictions on events are higher here. It's 100 people here in Phuket. So, I mean, I would, I would hope by the time that the Champ tournament comes around on the, uh, the 12th of November, I believe, that, uh, there'll be, uh, that we'll be able to have 150 people in a, in a group gathering, uh, I would hope. Excellent. Well, we look forward to that and I'm, I'm sure a few other games with our members uh, over the next couple of months and moving into 2022 as well. Good to see you, Chris. Yes, 100%. We can't wait. And uh, I'm looking forward to getting back to Bangkok and uh, getting back to the events. Chris Watson, Chief Commercial Officer for Golf Asian. Coming up next, our community section. Stay with us. And welcome back. In our community section today, we visit a safe haven for young Thai women in the north. I'd like to welcome Kunpichia Ayi, the house mother and general manager at Friends of Thai Daughters in Chiang Rai. Kun Mi, how are you? I'm good, thank you, Sadika. Good to see you. So Kun Mi, it's, it's a beautiful background you have there. A beautiful blue sky today. Thank you. It's from uh, the back, the backyard, from the house that we stay now in Chiang Rai. Oh, you certainly make me envious. I'd love to, to be up in Chiang Rai at the moment. Uh, Kun Mi, let, let's talk about Friends of Thai Daughters. Uh, can you tell us about the organization, when it was established, and when did you get involved? Friends of Thai Daughter is a non-profit organization. Uh, we are more than 15 years now. Friends of Thai Daughter provide education, safe children, and emotional support to the girl who are rich of human trafficking in the northern of Thailand. Friends of Thai Daughter was start when Patty and Jane were visiting in Thailand and learned about child trafficking of poor and stateless youth tribe girl. We realized that education was one way that girl could improve their situation. We also know that having a safe place to live with loving house mother would foster self-confidence and leadership. So that's why we start the Sunflower House in Chiang Rai. And I am the first daughter who joined the program. After I graduated from university, uh, we, we have a house in Chiang Mai and we closed out that house. And after I graduated, I told Jane and Patty that I still want to continue this amazing program because I would love to help more, more, more girl in, in my, in, uh, I mean, in, in Chiang Rai or in, 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 uh, uh, the, the girl who was have the same problem like me. Right. So I told Jen and Patty, I would love to, to continue. And Jen and Patty said, yes, they, they, will, they will support me to do, to do this program. So I start the house in Chiang Rai where we stay now. That, that's a really great story. And it, it's nice to, to see a product of the program success and, and continuing the success of, of that program. Uh, can you tell us a little about the girls living in the house? And the longer term, what does the future hold for them? The girl from poor family, maybe mom in, uh, is dead, dad in jail, or mom has a husband who won't accept the children. But our girl, they want to study, improve their life, help their family and community. We have about 60 girls under, under care, 15 at East House, and many in university, and some at home in Dai Village, where we provide support. Most of the girls are Hill Tribe girls, such as Aka, Lahu, Mong, and some of the girls, they are uh, stateless. So it is really hard for them to get some help from government. 
And our goal is to expand our help behind just our daughter and into their village and community to create lasting and better quality of life. Right. Well, so, and, and I guess um, the long-term future for them is to have a future like yours, to, to graduate and really make a decision to do whatever they want to do with their lives. Yes, I hope so. <laughs> and, and COVID-19 is, is always a question that, that we ask on this program. Uh, how has COVID-19 affected you and the Friends of Thai Daughters organisation? Oh, yes. COVID is having a terrible impact. No work, no money for food, clothes. So Friends of Thai Daughters helped by donating some blanket rice and food mm. to uh, Hill Thai Village. Go right. study back and forth between online and in person is difficult. Overseas sponsor can come visit the girl and help as they usually do also. Okay, good. Uh, you mentioned sponsors. So where do your donations come from? Uh, more than 90% are from the United States. Mm -hmm. And we also get some help from people, uh, wonderful people in Thailand too. Mm -hmm. uh, such as Luxembourg Embassy in Bangkok, NIST International in Bangkok, mm -hmm. and Rotary International has been very generous to us too. And this year we have a big project. We are building an Adobe house and make it to become a learning center for community and also to be the girl house and a farm also. And our Adobe house will last for many generations. The girl help make the brick so they will know how to make their own house in the future. Mm -hmm. The farm will be organic food to provide clean food and extra fruit and uh, fish, egg, and we can sell that product to make some money. People from Oksham can come visit us, learn about our program, uh, come to eat, at our restaurant and also can stay overnight at our guest house also. And uh, this will give our daughter opportunity to learn about business, hospitality, uh, agriculture, and also tourists. And Bruce Cobb company is really generous to donate high quality mentor for our roof, ensuring they will be long lasting Thank you, Kun Steve from Booth Group Company for this generous help. We still need the kitchen equipment like stove, refrigerator, oven, and other things like computer, bed, chair, and table for a new house. We also will, will be looking for internship for our university daughter after the COVID also. Uh, there's a lot of ways that Auschair members can can certainly help there in the future as well. And I'm sure our CSR committee uh, will be looking at uh, extending our support uh, for Friends of Thai Daughters in various ways, uh, as our members can see. Uh, cash donations, I'm sure, are, are welcome, but there are many other ways uh, that you can contribute. And I'm glad you mentioned NS Blue Scope, uh, who of course made a significant contribution with their product uh, in building the Adobe, Adobe House. So. Uh, certainly, if you're, you're interest, interested in supporting Friends of Die Daughters, uh, you, I can put you in contact with Kun Mi or you can contact me directly as well. Uh, yes. Kun Mi, do you have a final message for our Auschair me members? Yes, I would love to say thank you, Auschair, again for inviting Friends of Thai Daughter to be uh, your guest today. I am very honoured to be your guest and thank you. the. Thank you all the donor to help support Friends of Thai Daughter for a long time. And can enough to say thank you Kun Steve from Bruce Cove Company again to help uh, support for us. Thank you so much. Khao Kun Naka. Great. Thanks Kun Mi. And thank you to Blue Scope again and our CSR committee for connecting us with Friends of Thai Daughters. A very worthwhile project up there and we do look forward to getting up to that beautiful sunflower field and blue sky. Hope to see you soon, Kun Mei. Ta. Thank you. Well, that's it for today. Uh, we'd like to thank you for joining us and stay safe and well. See you next time.